Okay, we're going to start this um, this lecture on tissues. Now, I've given you a copy of my notes, so get your document. It's a Word document. I've given you copies of my notes. These are my notes, so it'll make it a little bit easier on you uh, as we go through this epithelial tissue. Uh, you can pay more attention to the lecture. You can write in the missing words. And it makes this a little easier for you. So if you think that I'm reading from this, I am. It's my notes. I would do this in class. And uh, the PowerPoint that we're using right now is the one that I would use in lecture if we were at school. So I would, you would all have copies of the notes, and I would point out these on the board, possibly do some drawings on the board, and um, fill out your notes, which is what's going to be on your test. Okay. So um, let me go ahead and get uh, this tissue put up. And um, we'll start the lecture. Okay, here's tissues. And if you look at your notes, a group of similar cells functioning together to perform a specialized activity. Right. Connected tissues are for strength and support, epithelial, cover, or line surfaces, muscle tissue, muscle contracts, like your heart and uh, around your blood vessels and digestive tract, and nervous tissue. It's going to be tissue that um, um, is involved in your nervous system, conducting impulses to glands and muscles. So we're going to talk about these as we go through here. I've got a couple of things to talk about on uh, the epithelium in general, and then we'll talk about some uh, more specific uh, detail, okay? Now, epithelial tissues are tissues which cover or line surfaces. So epithelium is your first blank there, epithelium. Um, a tissue which covers surfaces, lines body activities, and forms glands. All right, so epithelium covers surfaces. So there's going to be a free surface up here. You can see it right here. There's the apical surface, the part that's not attached to anything. And now at the bottom is the basal surface, and it's attached to underlying connective tissue. So all your epithelial tissues have a free surface. Okay, and I have on here examples of epithelial tissues, your skin. Now you know that that covers your body, and you know that one part of it's stuck to you, and the other part you can, you know, see on the outside of your body. Lines body cavities, the inside lining of your mouth, your esophagus, your, your large and small intestine, uh, inside lining of your uh, urinary bladder, your urethra, uh, blood vessels, inside the respiratory tract, your trachea, digestive, I just mentioned that. Blood vessels, I mentioned that also, and ducts, ducts from glands that deliver products like enzymes or acids or some type of a, a secretion. The cells are closely packed, so you can see that they're, they're next to each other on this picture here, and arranged in sheets or layers and always have a free surface. Again, there's your free surface. It's called the apical surface. Now, something else about this, we'll come back to this slide in a little bit. Let's look at the next slide. All epithelial tissues are avascular, avascular, without blood vessels, and nutrients must diffuse, or water must osmose, from the underlying vascularized tissues through the epithelium. So you can see down here below the epithelium, see epithelium, epidermis is avascular, but below it, the dermis, you see capillaries in there. It is vascular, and even below that, there are blood vessels, but not in the uh, epidermis. Now, think about this. If you've ever gotten a uh, paper cut, sometimes paper cuts bleed, and sometimes they don't. Well, if your paper cut only went through, or into, not through, but into the epidermis, um, you're not going to bleed. It's just going to be a little thin sliver of tissue there that kind of drives you nuts. The reason you're not bleeding is you haven't cut all the way through the epidermis down to the dermis. But when you get a paper cut and it does bleed, you've cut deeper in and you've cut some capillaries and they will bleed then. So you have some functions here to look at. Provide a physical protection of the underlying tissues from drying out, just like the skin of an apple or the, the peel of banana prevents them from dehydrating. You know, if you take those off, they dry up. But if that skin is there, it helps to reduce water loss, just like your skin on your body does. 
protects from UV light damage. UV light does DNA damage. So it's protecting the underlying tissues from UV light. And we'll see how it does that in just a little, little bit. Protects the underlying tissues from bacteria. Bacteria would love to use you as an energy source to live off of your body. And infections, infections are where bacteria has got a little grasp on part of your body. And then your immune system or medications will kill those bacteria and they're no longer present. And it also protects from physical damage. It acts as like a buffer or, you know, a padding, a little bit of a padding for the underlying tissue so they don't get, you know, hit as hard or damaged. Controls permeability of substances entering or exiting the body. It does. Um, it forms a multi-layer barrier there that will prevent bacteria from getting into you unless you have a cut or some type of an opening in your skin uh, prevents materials from getting in. Now, lipid-soluble materials, medications like the uh, nicoderm patches or nitroglycerin patches or your hormone patches, the medication is lipid-soluble. And you know that the cells have a phospholipid bilayer and lipids are soluble in lipids. So if it's a lipid-soluble medication, it can get through but other things will not be allowed into your body. Uh, number three, contain receptors for many environmental stimuli such as touch, smell, taste, vision, hearing, and equilibrium. Yes, those are all receptors that are monitoring different types of environmental stimuli. Just look at your hand. Uh, your hand can pick up textures like smooth or soft or rough, can pick up whether it's ripply or linear uh, or like sandpaper can pick up hot and cold and degrees in between there, can pick up uh, pain like from a pinprick or an acid burn or sunburn, uh, that's, those are damages. So you have receptors that in your regular just surface of your body, your skin, that can pick up several different types of environmental stimuli. Some epithelial cells are glands. A gland is any one or more cells that secretes a substance. So a gland can be a single cell. And the first one, it says secrete mucus. Well, some things called, some cells called goblet cells secrete mucus, and they are single cell glands. Sweat glands, oil glands uh, can secrete, you know, sweat, as well as um, an oil called sebum, which gives you oily skin, like your oily hair, oily forehead. And some enzymes are delivered by ducts like your pancreas delivers a lot of enzymes to your digestive tract by way of a duct. And that duct is lined with epithelium. Next blank is microvilli, microvilli, finger-like extensions of the plasma membrane. So the plasma membrane is folded into finger-like structures, which function to increase the surface area for absorption of nutrients. So these are not uh, things that require ATP. This is the plasma membrane that's formed finger-like folds. And instead of being flat across the top and having that amount of surface area, it has you know, many finger-like structures which increase the surface area tremendously. And this will be found like in your digestive tract, which is the picture on the left. That's the lining of your digestive tract. And you have, not only do you have folds in there to increase the surface area, but you have projections off the folds called a villus or a villi. And those villi are covered with columnar cells like these cells. And the surface of them has a tremendous surface area increase with these microvilli. Now I gave you the definition, I've already defined it, called a gland, one or more very specialized cells that secrete substances into ducts onto a surface or into the blood. And here are some nice uh, cells that have been definitely stained and colorized a little bit, but you can see the uh, microvilli on top of them. It's pretty cool. Under a microscope, you would see something that looks fuzzy, and they call it a brush border. It's the presence of these microvilli. So depending on how good the slide is, sometimes you can see these microvilli. Here's uh, some glands here, uh, salivary glands, multicellular glands, for making saliva. And I've, I've got some endocrine glands over here, which are multicellular, but endocrine glands secrete directly into the blood. 
right into the bloodstream. They're highly vascularized and their secretions go straight into the bloodstream. Those are endocrines, while exocrine are these that we're looking at here. Uh, they have by way of a duct or onto a surface and salivary glands have their secretions are delivered by way of ducts to the inside of your mouth. Now, cilia, um, well, let's just look at goblet cell next. That's your next blank. Goblet cells secrete mucus directly onto the surface of their epithelium. So goblet cells are modified columnar cells, and this is the lining of your digestive tract here, and these little hollow cells or goblet cells, little white ones, those are the goblet cells, those are goblets, which, which function to secrete mucus, which serves as a lubricant between the food and the walls of the digestive tract, as well as protect the lining from adverse pH and enzymes. Yes, that mucus protects you from your digestive processes because you are biomolecules, just like the biomolecules that you're ingesting. And those goblet cells produce mucus to put a barrier here between you and the foods that are being digested in your digestive tract. So they help protect you. Your next blank is cilia. Cilia are hair-like processes wait rhythmically to set up a current or direction of movement, and they do require ATP. So these are gonna be physical structures. If you remember from uh, general biology, they're microtubules and they are embedded in the membrane by something called a basal body. And that requires ATP to make those cilia move back and forth to move something. So I have some examples in the respiratory tract, Mucus secreted from the goblet cells traps foreign particles which have been inhaled. <clears throat> so you have some uh, goblet cells in your nasal lining also, and it produces mucus there. But sometimes when you breathe air in, it doesn't get trapped. The particles don't get trapped in that mucus layer. They get deeper into your system. So uh, these are secreted a little bit further on. The cilia move the mucus toward the throat where it is coughed out or swallowed. So when you have to cough and you feel a little material coming out of your respiratory tract, that's mucus that was produced by those goblet cells, and the cilia have beat that mucus to the top of your respiratory tract. It's called a mucus elevator, and so it keeps your, your uh, respiratory pathways clean, traps particulates that get in deep, and then they're purged. The cilia move them to the top of your respiratory tract, and you cough it out. Uh, so I have another example found in the respiratory tract. Okay, good. The uterus, fallopian tubes, the fallopian tubes are what move the egg that was ovulated from the ovary to the uterus, and they're lined with ciliated cells that will move that egg over about a three-day period to the uterus. The central canal of the spinal cord, we'll get to that toward the end of the, of the uh, class. There are little bitty um, small vessels that are lined with cells that are ciliated to keep your cerebral spinal fluid moving uh, in your nervous system. And we'll, we'll see that later on though. Your next blank is lamina propria, lamina propria. The surface of attachment between the epithelium and the underlying connective tissue. So I have it, I have it uh, boxed in here. The lamina propria is made up of secretions from the epithelial cell and from the underlying connective tissue. So in your, in your notes here, lamina propria, the surface of attachment between the epithelium and the underlying connective tissue. This membrane is composed of secretions from the epithelial cells, the top portion, which was called the basal membrane, basal lamina. Um, and the cells of the underlying connective tissue. So I've, I've broken the lamina propria down into what it is. Number one is basal lamina. Is a collagen and glycoprotein secretion by the epithelial cells. So uh, collagen is a type of a supportive fiber and glycoproteins are sticky. So it's putting out a sticky material with fibers in it just like uh, concrete has that metal rebar in there to help make the concrete stronger. Well, these cells are secreting a fiber as well as a glycoprotein, a sticky protein, to help hold these epithelial cells to the underlying tissues. Well, number two, the connective tissue down here, 
Number two is called the reticular lamina. It is a reticular fibers, it's a type of a collagen, and glycoproteins secreted by the underlying connective tissue. So the connective tissue is also secreting a fiber called reticular fibers, <clears throat> which are thought to be immature collagen fibers, and a glycoprotein, a sticky protein, just like the, uh, the epithelial cells did. And so it's like a glue zone, a glue zone between the epithelium on the surface and the underlying connective tissue. That's what the lamina propria basically is. Now, intercellular connections. We saw these in general biology, but I thought I needed to mention them in here too because we will probably talk about one or two of these as we go through the rest of this. So intercellular connections, there are, there are specialized attachment sites between epithelial cells themselves and the underlying tissues. These attachment sites are called cell junctions. And so let's look at some of these cell junctions. Number one is the one at the bottom right. These are gap junctions. If you remember, we're talking about animals. So this is the animal cells. It's called gap junctions. Small interlocking channels. These are protein channels. So you can see between cells. Here's the cell membrane of one on the right, this partial membrane. And here's a whole cell on the left here. You can see its membrane. So these channel proteins go between them, between adjacent cells, cells that are next to each other, and allow the exchange of ions and molecules between the cells most common in cardiac and smooth muscle. So the cytoplasms of the cells are in constant uh, communication with each other. The second one, look at the upper left. Number two is tight junctions. Tight junctions, a partial fusion of the cell membranes. You see right there, they're fused between adjacent cells, cells next to each other, to prevent passage of water, enzymes, or other fluids to the underlying tissues abundant in the cells of the digestive tract. Because if this is the digestive tract, there are acids and enzymes here breaking down biomolecules. If those acids and enzymes would get between the cells and get down to you, it would start digesting you. Those enzymes don't know you from what you just ate. So the tight junctions <coughs> uh, fuse the cell membranes uh, of the cells that are next to each other all the way around and form a tight junction so that nothing can get from the intestinal area down to you. Nothing can get in between the cells. The third type is called desmosomes. Desmosomes, the cells are held together by peptidoglycan secretions, these little protein filaments here, um, which are locked together by a protein plaque here. So it says protein filaments extending through the cell membrane and locked in place by a peptidoglycan plaque. So this, the fibers, uh, protein filaments are going between the cells, and then there's a plaque here that locks them to where they can't slide anymore, and the cells are held together. And we'll see that on a future picture uh, when we get to the, end, uh, the skin, stratified squamous epithelium. We'll see these desmosomes again. Classification of the epithelia. Well, the terms are important again in the uh, tissues here. So let's look at some terms. <clears throat> Number one is implying this uh, definition right here, simple. So number one is simple, one cell layer thick, usually found in areas of little wear and tear because it's only one cell layer thick. Function and absorption in the lungs these would be like your alveoli or a single cell layer of very, very flat cells that we'll look at in a minute called squamous cells. See, simple squamous and capillaries, which are also simple squamous. They're very, very thin, but simple says one cell layer thick. And even the capillaries are made of simple squamous. They're one cell layer thick. Uh, number two is stratified. Stratified means layered two or more layers. So it's found in areas of wear and tear, like your mouth, your esophagus, the integument, vagina. You know, your surface of your skin, there's friction there all the time from you lifting things, moving things around. 
the clothing rubbing on your on the surface of your body. So there are many layers of cells there. It's, it's stratified, and during the day, some of them slough off. And as they slough off, new ones are built from the bottom, and they push toward the top, and they slough off. So simple is one cell layer thick. Stratified is two or more cell layers thick. Now there's another term here. This it's not shown on this slide. It's called pseudo stratified. P S E U D O stratified. It means falsely layered. And we'll see one of those. It's only one cell layer thick, but it appears to have several layers of cells due to the fact that the nucleus in those cells can be found anywhere from the bottom of the cell to about uh, two thirds from the bottom of the cell. So any, pretty much anywhere in that, that long cell, you can find a nucleus positioned. Now let's look at some more terms. <clears throat> Squamous. Number four is squamous. Squamous means flat. The front of your forehead between your eyes, that's a squamosal region, and it's the flat spot in between your eyes, the flat of the forehead. Well, squamous means flat. And over here on the far right, you see simple squamous. One cell layer thick of flat cells. And I gave you some examples where you can find them, so just, you know, read over those. Number five is cuboidal. It means they're cube-shaped, somewhat like little alphabet blocks when you look at them on a slide. So cuboidal, cube-shaped. And you can see here is simple cuboidal, one cell layer of cube-shaped cells. Nice. Now we're not gonna look at stratified cuboidal. We're just gonna look at simple cuboidal. Number six is columnar. They're shaped like columns, like little cigars. So column-shaped cells. Uh, these, these are in like your uh, uh, stomach, large and small intestine. It's in your digestive tract. And here it is, one cell layer of column-shaped cells. Simple columnar. One cell layer of column-shaped cells. Well, here is one called stratified squamous. We just looked at up here, same thing. Our next one is called transitional. When something's in transitional, it appears to be in, in a changing shape. <clears throat> a combination of shapes from columnar to cuboidal. So it says cells appear to change shape going from the cells on the apical surface to the cells at the bottom of stratification. Now, one thing I noticed about this one, transitional epithelium can be found lining the urinary bladder in your ureters, which are the tubes from the uh, urinary bladder to the, uh, well, from, from the kidneys to the urinary bladder. But look at the transitional appearance. This is something that's very, very visual. Look at the cells on top. See that nucleus? It's implying that the cell, as well as the nucleus, is somewhat round. As you go deeper, look what happens to the shape of the nucleus. It becomes more and more oblong or more and more oval. So they appear to be transitioning from round to possibly column shaped. And that's what that's the transitional. So this is real easy. This is a good slide. This is of the uh, urinary bladder here. And you can see that they appear to be changing shape from round to elongated. Let's look at our first epithelium here. Simple squamous epithelium. A single cell layer of flat cells have a centrally located nucleus. And you can count, you can really hardly see them. This is a bird's eye shot. This is something called mesothelium. We'll look at it in just a minute. But these are this is a side shot. And these are the air sacs of lungs. This is the little alveoli, and so you're seeing it from the side. You can see how extremely thin these are, and there's a nucleus. See my fingers pointing? Nucleus. So there are several cells that make up these, these little air sacs all the way around uh, to make little air sacs. And this is the side shot, like from the edge. And you can see that they're very, very flat, and there's the nucleus. 
and that's all you're seeing here. It's very, very thin, and you see little black dots every so often. Those are nuclei of the cells. Um, so I have highly adapted to diffusion, osmosis, and filtration. Examples, alveoli, which is what this is right here, alveoli, air sacs of the lungs, and capillaries. They're, they're simple squamous epithelium, or what capillaries are made of, too. Uh, you have a blank there, and it's called endothelium, E N. D-O-T-H-E-L-I-U-M, endothelium. That means the inside lining. The simple squamous epithelium, which lines the heart, blood vessels, capillaries, and lymph vessels. So it's the endothelial lining inside the blood vessels and the heart. It's continuous throughout the entire cardiovascular system. Now, serous membranes are also simple squamous epithelium. So when we look at the simple, look at the uh, the serous membrane here. See simple squamous epithelium, mesothelia, lining of pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal cavities. This is the serous membrane, and you're seeing the cells from the top, from the surface. And so they they're kind of like uh, I don't know, pentagonal almost, and they have a central nucleus in there. But you're seeing a sheet of squamous epithelial cells sitting on a very very thin little layer layer of collagen uh, fibers, and that forms your, your serous membrane or your mesothelium. So I have examples, pleura of the thoracic cavity, peritoneum of the abdominal cavity, and um, pericardium of, around the heart. Simple cuboidal epithelium. One cell layer thick of cuboidal cells, cube-shaped cells. So it says have a large centrally located nucleus. That's one thing that I just love about this cell. It's cube-shaped and the nucleus is right in the middle and it's large and round for these cells. Now, these are forming a tubule here, so it's not gonna be real square, but they're somewhat, you can tell they're kind of bulky, have a large centrally located nucleus in them. Sometimes you can see the uh, the membranes of the cells a little easier than others, but you can basically tell that that's, those are cuboidal cells. Large, centrally located nucleus. Covers the surface of the ovaries, forms tubules of the kidneys, which is what these are right here. These are tubules of the kidneys. Lines uh, the ducts of some glands and is involved in gland, uh, secretion of glands. So uh, when they're stratified cuboidal, which we're not going to really look at in particular, but we will talk about some like salivary glands or stratified. Uh, they do have secretions that go into ducts, but these are making up tubules themselves, and they're one cell layer thick, simple cuboidal epithelium. Um, so you have functions in secretion like mucus, perspiration, or enzymes, absorption, uptake of fluids, and other substances. And we will see cuboidal uh, cells uh, cropping up in different uh, uh, topics that we'll talk about, different systems. Simple columnar epithelium. It says column-shaped cells, and these are. You can see from the drawing here, and you can see from the picture. They are somewhat column-shaped cells. The nucleus is usually located close to the base of the cell. And you can see that all these that I have here are located close to the base, because this is the apical surface in the middle. That's where something's going to flow through. So these are all lining. And here's your, see there, the basement membrane, the lamina propria is down here. Lamina propria is right there. And you can see on the drawing here that the nuclei pretty much are standard close to the bottom of the cell, close to the base. I gave you some examples. Lines the digestive tract from the stomach to the anus. So from the stomach all the way down to the anus, so that's the small intestine and large intestine lining, is simple columnar epithelium of the gallbladder and lining uh, and the excretory ducts of many glands have uh, simple columnar as the lining of that duct. Now you can't see on this picture here, but uh, we can see on the next one, we'll see some goblet cells. It changes topics, but let's just look at goblet cell first. <clears throat> These still have mucus in them. This dark purple granule stuff. See, mucus of goblet cell. So that blank there, goblet cell, a modified columnar cell which produces mucus. 
Now, this just so happens to be in your respiratory tract. So your next little topic there uh, is pseudostratified columnar epithelium, falsely layered column-shaped epithelium. And they call it pseudostratified because you see the nucleus isn't all just at the bottom. They're not all there. Here's some up there, a little higher, higher, higher. And each one of these nuclei is in one cell. And they don't have two layers here. The one cell goes from the bottom to the top. It's just that the nucleus can be positioned at the bottom all the way to the top of the cell. And these uh, slides are thin, but you can see through cells. And so you see the nuclei of cells behind other cells. And so it looks like it's, it's layered, but it's really not. So it's called pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Here's the cilia on top. Um, examples, I gave you some examples. You can look there. Um, respiratory tract, yeah. So there's a cilia there for moving mucus or moving uh, eggs or moving whatever. Uh, stratified squamous epithelium. And this is keratinized. Um, keratinized keratin is a, a protein which waterproofs and toughens the cells. And you know your skin is dry, but it's also kind of friction resistant and it is somewhat tough. When something hits it, it doesn't necessarily just tear the tissue away. It stays there and it acts as a buffer. So stratified squamous epithelium, two or more layers of cells, flat cells, so this says squamous. This arrangement is very durable, found in areas of wear and tear. The shape alters from columnar to cuboidal to squamous. Now that's from the bottom where I have number four here. I really haven't seen any columnar. I've basically seen cuboidal here, but they go from cube shaped to flat as they die and dry out. That's why it's called stratified squamous. The basal cells down here at the bottom, which you can see is slightly a little bit darker colored cells because they have some, they've been stained a little bit darker and they also have some cells in there called melanocytes that we'll talk about in a little bit, which give your skin its color. As the cells are produced by the basal cells, which is number four, four down here, they move toward the surface. They become dehydrated because they're further and further away from the blood supply, become keratinized, the waterproofing protein, and are eventually sloughed off the free surface. These are dead, dry cells up here, which we'll talk about their names in just a little bit. So you have a blank there called keratin, K-E-R-A-T-I-N, a protein which toughens and waterproofs the dead cells as well as resists bacterial infection. The cells are constantly sloughing off, so bacteria get, in, get in, uh, in between these cells, but then the cells slough off, and then there's some new cells and they slough off, and there's some new cells, and they slough off continuously. So the bacteria are trying to get to you, but your skin is being produced at a rate that the bacteria are sloughed off with all the dead cells. Non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. These are on wet surfaces. So non-keratinized, found on wet or moist surfaces in areas of wear and tear, but not absorption. Uh, lining of the mouth. You know that sometimes you'll bite your mouth and it repairs itself pretty quickly. That's stratified squamous epithelium. Your tongue, esophagus, vagina, those are all non-keratinized non because they're on moist surfaces. They don't have keratin that makes them, you know, uh, uh, friction resistant and uh, kind of waterproof. They're on moist surfaces where you have friction surfaces. Transitional epithelium. Cells, remember, appear in transition, different shapes as they go deeper. They are stratified. They're a type of stratified tissue, but you don't typically call it stratified transitional. Usually you just call it transitional epithelium. Um, a combination of shapes from columnar to cuboidal, urinary bladders and the ureters. So you can tell that this is definitely has several different shapes from the layering. It is stratified. You can tell that's the bottom of the stratification and there's the top apical surface up there. It's an under underlying connective tissue. So you can tell it has several layers to it. 
<clears throat> exocrine cells, or right, sorry, glands. Exocrine is what goes in the blank. Secrete their products into ducts that empty onto the surface of the epithelium or onto a free surface. So exocrine glands have ducts, tubes that they deliver their products to an area, you know, by way of a tube. Examples, goblet cells, they deliver onto the inside lining of your nasal cavity, uh, inside lining of your uh, digestive tract. Sweat glands, they deliver to the surface of the body, oil glands to the hairs and the surface of your body. Ceruminous glands, those are wax glands in your ear. Salivary glands by way of ducts, which go to your, your oral cavity. Digestive glands, which empty into the uh, digestive tract to help further digest your food. Now we have unicellular glands, single cell glands like the goblet cell, which I pointed out again right here, these little hollow ones here, a little white. Those are goblet cells. Single cell glands are called goblet cells and they secrete mucus. Multicellular, many cell glands, intestinal, gastric, uterine, sudoriferous. Here's some uh, sweat glands. Here's sebaceous oil gland here. It secretes a fluid uh, called sebum, it's an oil. It coats your hair and it comes out over the surface of your skin too. So it conditions your hair as well as the surface of your scalp. Um, we have some eccrine glands here, sweat glands, like in your uh, scalp and your palms, the soles of your feet, you know, there and there. And uh, they, they deliver sweat to the surface by way of a duct. And then you have an apocrine gland here, which is in your armpits. Um, these are going to deliver sweat by way of a duct to your armpit area. Categories of sweat glands. Okay, we have several categories here. Now our first one, number one in your notes, is holocrine. H-O-L-O-C-R-I-N-E. Glands which accumulate their secretory product in their cytoplasm, the cell dies and sloughs off with its contents as the glandular secretion. And it says the sebaceous glands of the skin that we just saw. Now, how I remember this when I was going to school is holocrine. Whole, whole sounds like the whole, like, like W-H-O-L-E. So the whole cell pension, you know, dies and it's taken off as the secretion. It contains the secretion. So holocrine, secretory cell together with its accumulated secretion. The cell with its secretions is released. Number two in your notes is marocrine. Marocrine or eccrine sweat glands. The secretory product is discharged from the cell. So you can see here that the cells are, dis are discharging something into the duct. So they're releasing it by exocytosis into the duct, which the duct carries it to the surface. And then our third one in our notes is the apocrine. Apocrine glands which, uh, in which the secretory product is accumulated in the outer margin of the cell, which is pinched off from the cell to form the secretion. And it mentions mammary, uh, mammary glands here, like lactating uh, females. And if you look at this, you know what apex means? Apex means tip. In apocrine glands, is the tips are pinched off with the secretion. So the tip of the cell is a packet of secretions that is sloughed off, and that's the secretion. So those should not be too hard to remember. And so know an example of each, okay? Endocrine glands. I have two people here, and you can see that there are different endocrine glands are pointed out here. So endocrine glands goes in that blank, secrete their products, which are called hormones, directly into the blood. And examples, here's a, a new word here for the pituitary gland. It's called the hypothesis, and that's the one that more textbooks are putting in place now. So the word is trying to be changed, and it makes sense. It's taken, you know, 40 or 50 years to change it, but uh, this is a good change, and you'll see why when we get to the skull. The thyroid in the throat, 
adrenal glands on top of the kidneys. Those are some ones you're familiar with. Uh, ovaries and testes are glandular. Uh, part of them is glandular. The whole, the whole uh, organ is not glandular, just parts of it. <clears throat> so those are exocrine glands, and they're going to secrete their products directly into the bloodstream. Those are endocrine glands, I'm sorry. Connective tissue, or CT. CT is a way you can abbreviate connective tissue. So that goes in your blank, connective tissue, which protect and support the body and its organs and stores energy reserves. It's usually highly vascular, except for car cartilage. Cartilage is a basically a dead tissue. There are some chondrocytes around the outside that are still living, but the cartilage itself is, is dead tissue. They do not occur on free surfaces. Okay, connective tissues do not appear on free surfaces. Connective tissues contain cells, fibers, and a background matrix or ground substance, something that the cells are sitting in. So fibers, cells, and some type of a material that the cells are sitting in. Now there's, uh, we have um, mesenchyme. Well, mesenchyme is, is over here, mesenchymal stem cells. We call them stem cells now. So mesenchymal cells are, are what we call stem cells. And look at the definition. Embryonic tissue gives rise to all the other connective tissues. <clears throat> and you can see here, there's a mesenchymal cell or stem cell up here. And look at what it gives rise to. Bone, I uh, can't read it, muscle, <laughs> nerve, uh, uh, your other connective tissues. So all your connective tissues here come from stem cells. Right now, research, uh, you know, institutions or researchers can um, cause stem cells to become different types of tissues. They have ways of harvesting uh, cells and converting them back into a stem cell, and then they can change the type of cell that they mature into. So research has come a long, long way. Now, some types of fibers, uh, says dermal fibroblasts produce. Uh, fibroblast means fiber former. And we have collagen fibers. Collagen, composed of the protein collagen. Tough, flexible, non-resilient, provides strength and support. So collagen fibers are why your tissues, like your skin, is nice and tight and firm right now. And you know, your grandparents are soft because as you get older, the fibroblasts start to die off and you make less collagen and less elastic uh, tissue also. And you get softer. Your tissues are more brittle. So collagen fibers composed of collagen. The next blank is elastic fibers. Elastic fibers composed of the protein elastin. Freely branching fibers, very elastic. They're like rubber bands in your tissue. Like on your skin, it can be pulled and it snaps back. But you know, you get on your great grandparents or something and you kind of pucker their skin and it kind of stays there. So it doesn't have elastic fibers anymore, nor is it very firm. Uh, reticular fibers, which are uh, not shown right here, uh, but it's R E T I C U L A R fibers. Possible immature collagen fibers provide strength and support. Now you have a word which is at the top here, fibroblast. There it is. It's already in your notes, so produce fibers and ground substance. So my definition here is produce fibers. They're large flat cells, produce hyaluronic acid, which is a ground substance, the background substance that these fibers are sitting in, is collagen, elastic, and reticular fibers. Now, macrophages, macrophages, uh, well, yeah, these are large cells that specialize in phagocytosis. Macro means big, and phage is to, it means cell eating. So they're a very important cell to have for fighting off uh, infections like bacteria, a type of a white blood cell. Plasma cells produce antibodies for immunity formed from B lymphocytes 
and you don't have to really worry about the shape, but that's what they form there. Plasma cells produce antibodies. Mast cells develop from basophils. It says um, secrete heparin and histamine. That's to uh, help more blood flow get to an area before clotting happens. And then we have some called, and your next blank, melanocytes. Melanocytes, these are pigment cells. These are the cells that are responsible for the colors of your body, your hair color, your eye color, your skin color. These are the pigments. It's all genetically predispositioned as to how, many of, how much of this pigment is deposited and which type of melanin is deposited to give you your, your skin colors. You know, you have different eye colors, you have different hair colors and different skin tones. It's all due to the melanocytes. Here's some down here for your hair at the very bottom right. Melanocytes there forming the hair. Now for your connective tissues, here's a loose or a realer connective tissue. It can be called loose connective tissue or a realer connective tissue. Named this way due to the loose arrangement of fibers. And you can see that it looks real open in here real open. And you see that the fibers in here, you can see they're very thin. The thin dark ones here are elastic fibers. And the thicker light pink ones are collagen fibers. Now there's reticular in here too, we just can't, you just never can't see it. So this areolar connective tissue contains elastic fibers, collagen fibers, and reticular fibers are all in here. But the ones you can see are the thin elastic fibers and then the thick um, collagen fibers you can see there. We're not going to get involved in all the different types of cells you can find in here because you have to look at the nucleus of the cells and stuff like that. We're not going to do that. So, you know, location uh, under the epithelia. This is what uh, holds your skin to the under underlying muscle. It's around blood vessels. Um, Two packages of organs surrounds capillaries. Um, yeah, when you peel like the uh, skin off a piece of chicken, let's say, and you see that real light colored um, something that kind of you, you hear it and you can see it kind of disappearing as you pull the skin off. Well, that's this loose connective tissue that's holding the skin to that muscle, uh, holds the two together. Adipose, that's, that's basically fat, but on a test, don't put fat, put adipose. It's a connective tissue. It says fat cells specialized for fat storage or storage of lipids found all over the body uh, below the skin to reduce heat loss. So it does have a, an insulating property there to help maintain your body temperature. Around the kidneys, the kidneys are supported by an adipose capsule behind the eyeballs to help act as a cushion if you get hit in the eye. Around the heart, okay. In the bone marrow cavity, okay, you can find, uh, when, if you've ever had a steak called a round steak, there's a little round bone there, and it's part of the leg bone. You can see that there is fat inside of there. Around joints, and it's a major energy reserve. So carbohydrates, basically, that are not burned off by your body can be stored uh, as adipose in your body. And you can see that some areas, uh, it's all over your body. So uh, mammary glands, that's going to be naturally deposited there, but other areas of your body, uh, like your belly, you know, all around your body, you're going to have fat deposits. Reticular connective tissue contains many interlacing reticular fibers. These brown fibers here, these short little brown jagged fibers, uh, forms a network, network mesh. Um, uh, the word reticular means network, like a hairnet type of a thing. Uh, in many organs, called the stroma, S-T-R-O-M-A, stroma. The liver, spleen, and lymph organs have a lot of reticular connective tissue. And you can see when it forms that mesh or that network, these macrophages are able to um, lodge themselves in this network. And fluids that come past here, like lymph, it flows through this, or even blood, 
is exposed to these macrophages and they will determine whether those cells need to be removed or they're allowed to circulate again. This is uh, dense regular connective tissue. So the uh, dense regular, that means that the dense implies a lot of collagen fibers. Regular means the direction. So there's kind of wavy, but they're all going the same direction. I'm not going to have dense regular. It looks kind of weird. We're not going to do that one. So here's dense regular. And these little dark structures here, these are the nuclei of fibroblast, the fiber formers, the cells that made all these collagen fibers. So you can see that in there. So dense regular connective tissue packed with collagen fibers. The collagen fibers are flexible, but not elastic. These do not stretch. They'll bend like your tendons and ligaments, but if you pull them, they'll snap. Like when you pull silly putty real quick, it snaps. That's going to be what happens to a tendon. Now we have a word that means cartilage cells, and it's chondrocytes. Chondro means cartilage, site means cell. So these are cartilage cells, chondrocytes. Now the cartilage cells are in a space because you know cartilages are somewhat semi-solid, and so they're occupying a space, and that's the space, that space is called a lacuna. L-A-C-U-N-A-E, that's plural there. That's the space, and it means little lake. So it's a little lake. The physical space the chondrocytes occupy in the matrix, in the cartilage matrix, because you know cartilages are semi-solid, and these cells are in there, and so the space they occupy is called the lacuna. An example, when I was little, my mom used to make jello, and she would pour fruit cocktail in that jello and let it harden. And so it looked really cool to us. It was something special. If you got a little knife and you cut a grape out of that jello, there'd be a space left in there that the grape occupied. That would be the same thing. The grape would be the cell and the space that it occupied is the lacuna. Now perichondrium, that's the next blank, a dense connective tissue covering of the cartilage. It's on the surface of the cartilage. Okay, uh, it's, it's collagen and it covers the, the cartilage. It's called the perichondrium, means around the cartilage. So let's look at cartilages. There's three cartilages we can look at. They all have something in common. The common thing is they all have chondrocytes. <clears throat> and somewhere in that field of view, you're going to see what this look, what looks just like this, a pair of cross-eyed cells. These cells divided and they didn't get far enough apart before the cartilage died. So let's look at some of these. This first one is number five on your notes. It's called hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage, it means like clear. Hyaline is like clear. And you're talking about the background, you don't see any fibers. So on these, you're going to be looking for the background to tell what type of cartilage this is. I've already given you a, a, a clue. Here's the cross-eyed cells here. All these are chondrocytes. All these cells are chondrocytes. This is a characteristic of cartilages. Somewhere in that field, you're going to see some cross-eyed cells, like little, little cartoon eyes here. This is hyaline cartilage. Contains collagen fibers. You just can't see them. You look at the background, the background matrix looks clear. It does have co collagen fibers, but you don't see them. And where you can find hyaline cartilage, the ends of long bones, uh, the larynx, that's your, your voice box, the trachea, that's your windpipe, the branches of the trachea called bronchi, the septum of your nose in between your nostrils, you have that little piece of cartilage there, that's uh, hyaline cartilage, between your ribs and the sternum. If you remember, I talked about hypochondriac region below the cartilage, and I told you that Cartilage connects, and here it is right here. Here's the cartilage. See, it's uh, uh, costal cartilage. That's hyaline cartilage, and there's your ribs. So when you feel that, that's actually cartilage, not bone. Around to the side and the back, that's bone, but not in the front. 
So hyaline cartilage, you know it's a cartilage because it has chondrocytes, paracrocyte cells somewhere in that field of vision, you know, or field of view, and you don't see any fibers. Hyaline means clear. You don't see any fibers. Let's look at another cartilage. Elastic cartilage. Now look at this one. Gee, cross-eyed cells, cross-eyed cells, cross-eyed cells, cross-eyed cells. You see a lot of evidence that it's a cartilage because you see the chondrocytes are somewhere in there. You're going to find the cross-eyed cell appearance. Let's look at this one's called elastic cartilage. Now why is it called elastic cartilage? because you see real fine little fuzzy uh, um, threads in here of elastic, uh, elastic uh, fibers. And this cartilage is kind of, kind of soft and it bends. So it contains elastic fibers found at the tip of the nose, the epiglottis, which is uh, in your respiratory tract, and the penna of the ear, part of your ear that sticks out. You know, you can grab your ear, you can, you can crush it over like you're talking with your ear and it pops back. That's elastic cartilage. So you look at this and you see the cross-eyed cells in there. Okay, I know it's a cartilage. You look at the background. Is it clear? No, it's got some really cottony, fuzzy-looking fibers here. Those cottony, fuzzy-looking fibers are elastic fibers, and that's elastic cartilage. But there's one more cartilage, and this is called fibrocartilage. Look in here. You look around and say, oh, hey, look at that. There's a pair of chondrocytes. There's another pair. There's another pair. This is a cartilage. So is the background clear? No. Does it have cottony looking fibers there? No. These fibers are all going the same direction from left to right. This is fibrocartilage. Contains collagen fibers. So you can see these collagen fibers found in the meniscus of the knee, the intervertebral discs, the disc between your vertebrae, and something called the pubic symphysis, which is in the front of your, your pelvic area, it holds the two bones together in the front, is fibrocartilage also. So it tells you where you can find it. So look over these. First thing you're looking for is the uh, cells, chondrocytes. You know it's a cartilage. So which one is it? If it's clear, clear background, it's hyaline. If it has cottony, fuzzy fibers going everywhere, that's elastic fibers, that's elastic cartilage. If the fibers are all going one direction, like left to right, in this case, but it's not fuzzy and you can see fibers, those are collagen fibers and that's fibrocartilage, a very tough cartilage. Here is osseous tissue, this is bone. And you can see these little circular things here. These are called, uh, um, they used to be called uh, haversion systems. Now they're called osteons. I don't see the word here, but it's called an osteon. So this is compact bone, and these circular things are called osteons. So number eight is osseous tissue, bone. Bone cells are called osteocytes. So osteocytes, and there's it is over there on the left. Osteocytes uh, also lay in lacunae. So you can see the little black structure here in rings, and we'll talk about those rings more when we get to the bone. But those are where the osteocytes occupy or live, and they're called lacunae. There it is again. So osteocytes occupy a space in solid compact bone, and that space they occupy is called a lacuna just like the space that the uh, chondrocytes occupy in, in cartilages, it's also called a lacuna. Moving to must to, oh wait, F, one more, I forgot about this, it's not in your notes, but blood is also a connective tissue because it does have cells, okay? It does have fibers. When, when uh, blood clotting is formed, it makes fibers called fibrin and it does have a background matrix, the plasma. So blood is also a type of connective tissue. So you might want to write that in as number nine on your notes. Blood is a type of connective tissue. Red and white blood cells, uh, plasma is the background matrix, and it can produce fibers, which would be like fibrin for a blood clot. 
So we move to muscle, another type of tissue. We did epithelial tissue. We did connective tissue. Now we're on the last two, uh, muscle and then nervous tissue. So this is muscle. And this is uh, it says muscle tissue, tissue specialized for contraction, which results in movement, also involved in the generation of heat. So these are the cells that can shorten and then extend again. They can shorten and return to their extended shape. No other cell can do this. That's why these are called muscle. So the first one in your notes, this is this one here, smooth muscle, also called involuntary muscle due to the fact it's under autonomic control. You don't control this muscle. This is the muscle that moves food through your digestive tract for you. After you've eaten something like a Whataburger, it goes into your stomach and it's moved through your digestive tract by smooth muscle contracting and moving it one direction from the mouth to the anus. This is also the muscle that surrounds uh, blood vessels to control blood flow. You know, sometimes you have cold hands, sometimes you have warm hands. If you have cold hands, this smooth muscle has restricted blood flow to your extremities. So it's closed down blood going to your capillaries. If your skin is warm, then the muscle is relaxed and increased the blood flow to your capillaries. So your skin is warm and you can get rid of excess heat. <clears throat> so I gave you some areas found in the urinary bladder around blood vessels, around the digestive tract, the iris of the eye. When you move from a, a, a light area to a dark area, you see the iris opens the pupil and you can actually see it moving. It's a slow movement. Around bronchioles in your lungs. Bronchioles are little air passageways that go to the alveoli and there's muscle around them that can control um, the exchange of gases between your blood and your lungs. And people that have asthma, have those bronchodilators that causes the smooth muscle to relax to open the airways back up. Let's look at that one more time. Look at the shape of it. They are somewhat spindle shaped and they have an oval shaped nucleus. When you look at it on the slide, you see that you can't see the spindle shape of the cell membrane, but you can see that the nuclei are oval shaped and it looks like a bird's eye view of a bunch of kayak going down a stream. That's what it always reminded me of. So it's real easy. And they're in bundles. See, here's the edge of one bundle. Here's the edge of that bundle over here. So they're all going downstream. These uh, right here are coming towards you. And they got cut right across the nucleus itself. And so you see little dots. Skeletal muscle. These are long. Uh, this is number two, skeletal muscle. Also called striated, but it's best to just stick to skeletal due to striations, that's the bands. The bands are called striations. You see these nice little wavy bands here. <clears throat> and voluntary muscle, because it's due to being consciously controlled. So it's found between bone and bone. That's why I call it skeletal, it's between bones. And when this muscle contracts, you know, it moves uh, the bones at the joint. Now these are long cylindrically shaped, and you can see one drawn out here. They are multinucleate which means they have more than one nucleus. And the nuclei are pushed to the outside of the cell. So they kind of pushed, pushed to the outside part. So the nuclei are not in the middle. They're all pushed against the outside of the membrane here. You can see them riding on the outside here. So this is voluntary muscle. It's called skeletal muscle. Long, cylindrically shaped uh, cells, striated, multinucleate, and the uh, nuclei are pushed to the outside. They're multinucleate because when you are being formed, uh, these cells are made from cells called myoblasts that join together, and each one brought a nucleus with it. And so these are the cells in your body that are multinucleate. Cardiac muscle on your heart, only found in the heart. And you can see that it's also striated. That's why you don't call skeletal striated because muscle cardiac muscle is also striated so you call skeletal skeletal and you call cardiac cardiac now all these cardiac cells here we'll look at it a little bit more in detail later uh, you can tell it's cardiac because of the striations for one but where the cardiac cells fuse to another cardiac cell you see these dark linear structures here called intercalated discs it's where the 
uh, membranes have fused between this cardiac cell and the one over here, between this cardiac cell and the one over here, this cardiac cell and the one over here, they fuse together and they, these cells will branch and when they contract, they contract in all different areas, you know, from the uh, side to side, front to back, at angles. Uh, so you get a very um, strong compression when the heart beats to force that blood into the body. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the uh, cardiovascular uh, chapter, which is in the second semester. Nervous tissue. This is our last tissue. Tissue which has the ability to initiate and transmit electrical nerve impulses that coordinate body activities. <clears throat> the only cells that can conduct an impulse are nervous cells, our nerve tissue, and muscle. Muscle can also conduct an impulse. So we have some different, um, I guess, varieties of these neurons, and we're only going to look at a very few, okay? We have, the number one is unipolar. Unipolar has one extension from the cell body, and there it is right there, one extension coming off the cell body, which divides into two branches. One of the branches acts as an axon, and the other acts as a dendrite. Axons convey impulses away from the cell body. Dendrites conduct impulses toward the cell body. So up here at the top, that's going to be a dendrite. The one after the branch, this is an axon, taking the impulse away. Number two is bipolar. That means there are two branches off of the cell body. One acts as an axon, which is this bottom one again, taking the impulse away from the cell body. The other one acts as a dendrite, conducting an impulse toward the cell body. The third one is multicellular. This means that, uh, or sorry, multipolar. This is a giant multipolar uh, neuron. It has many, more than two branches off the cell body. Now, it only has one axon though. So it has one axon that conveys an impulse away from the cell body, and it can have two or more dendrites. This one's got uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight dendrites conducting impulses toward the cell body. The impulses go across the cell body and leave this neuron by the way of one axon. So multipolar has one axon and two or more dendrites. All these are dendrites. <clears throat> Now, number four is glial cells or neuroglia. Neuroglia means nerve glue, and glial cells means glue cells. And these support the neurons by holding them close to capillaries, like uh, up here at the top, the astrocyte here. And even uh, an astrocyte, that's going to do that. Um, and they have, they have a good supply of uh, nutrients. Um, to the nerve cell so it functions more effectively and forming protective wrappings around uh, the cell like the myelin sheath which conducts an impulse and you see right here is just showing the wrappings of each of these glial cells like this oligodendrocyte does that uh, and this increased the conduction and we'll talk about that when we get to the nervous system but one type of glial cell forms something called a myelin sheath which which increases the impulse conduction Another type is a uh, phagocytic cell, microglial cell. This is like a, like a white blood cell. It keeps uh, the uh, nervous system free of any type of foreign agents or any damage that will clean it up. And then another type called ependymal cells. Ependymal cells are going to line some cavities in the brain called ventricle, ventricles. And the ventricles um, that are lined with these ependymal cells, the ependymal cells can move. By having cilia, they can move the cerebral spinal fluid, and others have microvilli to secrete cerebral spinal fluid. So they change in type from ciliated to having microvilli, depending on where they are. So these are supportive cells for the nervous system. Um, they support the neurons by protecting them, holding them close, forming the myelin sheath, producing cerebral spinal fluid. And that's all we have to talk about on tissues.